At 3 p.m. on October 31st, 1968, 36-year-old Donald Crowhurst set sail from Tynmouth in southwest England on a round-the-world solo yacht race. He was the last of nine competitors and just made the cutoff date. But Crowhurst's boat, a newly built 41-foot trimaran named the Tynmouth Electron, ran into problems from the start. Crowhurst couldn't hoist the sails properly and had to be towed back into harbor to untangle the halyards and stays. Two hours later, he was finally underway as his anxious wife and children looked on. Crowhurst's limited experience as a weekend sailor scarcely qualified him for such a hazardous undertaking. Few people gave him any chance of success. But despite his inauspicious start, Crowhurst was soon sending back reports of steady progress. At one point, he claimed to be making 243 miles a day. To everyone's surprise, he now seemed certain to win the 30,000 mile race. Then on July 10, 1969, almost nine months after leaving England, Crowhurst's boat was seen drifting alone about 700 miles southwest of the Azores in the mid-Atlantic. But there was no sign of him. Donald Crowhurst had vanished without a trace. Donald Crowhurst lived with his wife and four children in Bridgewater, Somerset, where after serving in the armed forces, he started a small electronics company. His most promising product was the Navigator, a radio direction finding device for yachtsmen. He was convinced it would make a fortune. But business was down, and Crowhurst became seriously worried for the future of his growing family. Then in March 1968, the Sunday Times announced a round the world yacht race with a 5,000 pound prize for first place. Thinking this could be his salvation, Crowhurst signed up. He remortgaged his house to pay for a new boat, but it still wasn't enough. So he managed to persuade Stanley Best, a wealthy caravan dealer, to be his sponsor. This is really was an exciting venture, and I'm not an adventurous person, so far as I'm concerned, but it like, was interesting and compelling to join in, even at a distance. Crowhurst decided to get a multi-hulled trimaran, spacious and fast. They were the racing boats of the future. He designed and incorporated various devices into the boat, including a masthead buoyancy bag, which would inflate if the boat capsized. Built in record time, the new boat was launched on September 23rd by Crowhurst's wife, Claire. But the champagne bottle failed to break on impact with the hull. It was a bad sign of things to come. The trimaran was called the Tynmouth Electron at the suggestion of Rodney Hallworth, publicity officer for the Devon Seaside Resort of Tynmouth. Hallworth, a former newspaper reporter, knew that the ensuing publicity would bring visitors flocking to the small town. He negotiated a deal with the BBC, which provided Crowhurst with a film camera and tape recorder to cover the voyage. News editor Donald Kerr recalled his feelings at the time. We negotiated a contract with Rodney Holworth. It was a very small contract, 250 pounds, and another 150 pounds when the film was delivered at the end of the race. Now, we didn't know how it was going to turn out, whether this was just going to be a few hundred feet of film from a man who got partway around the world, whether we were dealing with the potential winner, or whether it was just going to be a nice feature film of showing life at sea. So it was left open. If Donald Crow has succeeded and the film was good, then he would be paid considerably more. On October 2nd, after a week of feverish activity, Crowhurst started sailing Tynmouth Electron down the coast from Norfolk, where it had been built, to Tynmouth. But due to his inexperience, seasickness, adverse weather, and faulty equipment, the 300-mile journey took two weeks instead of the expected three days. By the time Crowhurst arrived, there were just 16 days to go before the cutoff date of October 31st, set by the organizers. 
frantic efforts were made to get the boat ready in time and loaded up with enough supplies to last eight months. There were so many boxes that Crowhurst scarcely knew where to put them all. His wife and four children checked into a local hotel and were on hand every day to watch the preparations. Simon Crowhurst, eight years old at the time, remembered the chaos. The boat wasn't ready and there was the tension uh, and the sense of something approaching doom that was in the air. Local seamen were openly contemptuous. They were convinced Crowhurst didn't stand a chance. My idea in a gale of wind would be to uh, have something that you could snuggle down and eave to, but I don't hear though you can eave a thing like that to. There's nothing in the water, you see, to counteract the force of the wind. He'll just blow away before the wind, blow to leeward all the time. I could spend half his time broadside on. Around the world sideways. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> At the same time, Claire Crowhurst, although still immensely loyal to her husband, was also beginning to have profound misgivings. But she knew that nothing would change his mind. Because he'd been interested in sailing around the world for a very long time. And the fact that several other people had already announced their intention of making this trip just um, brought it forward, really. I think it might have been as much as 20 years hence otherwise. Although apprehensive, Crowhurst was trapped by his ambition and the promises he'd made to everyone. He knew in his heart of hearts that neither he nor his boat were ready, but it was too late to stop now. At room service? If you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try again. Geronimo! Oh. During our biggest hotel sale, you can afford a real holiday this holiday. And our unprecedented low price guarantee means you can buy with confidence. If you find a lower price online, we'll match it any time prior to the day of check-in. Travelocity, you'll never roam alone. We now offer phone service for $1.70 a month with Magic Jack. That's just $19.95 a year. $19.95 a year. We give you free local and long distance and your own phone number. Replace your phone company or add a second line with Magic Jack. Falls are the number one cause of injury to senior citizens. Falling down stairs can be disastrous. Acorn Stairlifts has a solution. Just don't fall. Sit, relax, ride with an Acorn Stairlift, the world's leader in stairlifts. That's right. Don't let limited mobility keep you from going up and down your stairs, even outside. Call Acorn Stairlifts now for a free information kit and no obligation quote. Now you can safely ride with your Acorn Stairlift. Now I don't have to worry about him climbing those stairs again. And our Acorn Stairlift was very affordable. Our Acorn Stairlift is definitely more affordable than moving. The Acorn Stairlift has a padded seat and backrest for maximum comfort. It easily folds up for access to the stairway. Five safety sensors stop your Acorn Stairlift if there's something in the way and it even runs during power outages. And I'm the king of my own castle again. You'll be working directly with the world's leader in stair lifts. That's right, there's no middleman. Acorn's trained technicians professionally install your stair lift directly to the staircase, in most cases in two hours or less, with no need for special construction. We don't leave until you're completely comfortable using your Acorn stair lift. Don't risk a serious fall down the stairs. I was really surprised at how little they cost. Call for your free no obligation information kit and quote from Acorn Stairlifts. Just don't fall. Safely ride up and down your steps. Give your life a lift with the Acorn Stairlift. Call 1-800-821-6536 for your free no obligation information. That number again is 1-800-821-6536. 1-800-821-6536. Call now. Call now.
Here, Kitty Kitty, clipping Kitty's claws is impossible. Now Kitty can trim her own claws with Emery Cat, the fun new kitty scratcher that grooms cats' claws while they play. Clippers cut too close, causing pain. But Emery Cat's honeycomb design works like a powerful emery board. When infused with catnip, Kitty keeps coming back for safe groomed nails. The arch design is ideal for larger cats, too. It even has a playful toy. Ordinary posts cost $100 and won't trim your cat's claws. But Emery Cat is just $19.95 with durable base emery board infused with catnip and cat toy. As a bonus, you also get the de-shatter. It goes deep down to the undercoat to help eliminate shedding. It's a $15 value, free. Call now and we'll send you a second emery cat and de-shatter, free. Just pay processing and handling. Two emery cat boards plus two de-shatters for just $19.95. Call now. To order your emery cat board for $19.95 plus processing and handling, call 1-800-817-9552. That's 1-800-817-9552 or go online at emerycat.com. Donald Prohurst finally set sail for his round-the-world attempt at 3 p.m. on October 31st, 1968. But disaster struck almost immediately. Prohurst couldn't hoist the sails properly, and within a short time had to be towed back to harbor where a rigger climbed the mast to sort out the mess. Almost two hours later, Prohurst, feeling frustrated and humiliated, was off again. This time, there were no hitches, and the Tynmouth Electron soon disappeared from view. Rodney Hallworth, Tynmouth's publicity officer, recalled the occasion. About five o'clock at night it was. A gray sky started to die, and he just finished up a sort of pinpoint on the horizon. We all came back and never saw him again. Crowhurst spent the next day clearing his cabin, which was strewn with hastily loaded last-minute supplies. I have never put to sea in such a completely unprepared state in my life. Nevertheless, stipulations were that competitors would leave by the 31st, and leave by the 31st I did. Progress was painfully slow. By the end of the second week, Crowhurst was still off the coast of Portugal, having managed only 800 miles. At this point on the voyage, he should have covered at least 1,300 miles in the previous six days. On November 29th, Crowhurst finally reached the Canary Islands, about 60 miles off the northwest coast of Africa. But at this rate, he knew he had no chance of winning the 30,000-mile race. Slowly, an insidious plan began to take shape in his mind. What was to stop him from falsifying the logs, putting him miles ahead of his actual position? How would anyone know otherwise? Meanwhile, he continued to send a stream of optimistic radio signals back to the UK, reporting that he was in high spirits and making steady progress. On December 6th, Crowhurst made the first of his false entries in the log. Five days later, he claimed he was south of the equator and heading toward Cape Town at 243 miles a day. But as the solid line shows, Prohurst was still in the Atlantic, just off the Cape Verde Islands, 300 miles from the west coast of Africa. It would be another two weeks before he crossed the equator. On Christmas Day, as he headed down the coast of Brazil, Prohurst ate a lonely meal and played a soulful lament on his harmonica. 
I've been alone now for very nearly two months. Not that uh, I'm depressed or feeling sorry for myself by any means, but there is a spirituality about this place and about the time, Christmas, that does tend to make one a little bit melancholy. On January 19, 1969, after 75 days at sea, Crowhurst reported that he was approaching Goth Island in the South Atlantic. In reality, he was still meandering around the Brazilian coast 3,000 miles away. Captain Craig Rich, the race navigation consultant, recalled his curiosity at the time. Obviously, the boat wasn't in very good condition. We know that. But nonetheless, he continued to plug southwards down the Brazilian coast here while telling everybody he was off around the Roaring Forties. But that's all we knew at that stage because um, he stopped sending radio messages. When he said their transmissions were impossible, he was leading up to the fact that he was going to go out of radio communication because if he'd kept in radio contact going across the Southern Ocean, the only way he could have got his messages back is through the local, and I use that in inverted commas, uh, radio station, which would have been Wellington. He was operating through Buenos Aires because he was close enough and in radio distance. But he couldn't send anything through Wellington because, in fact, he wasn't there. But publicist Hallworth had no way of knowing this and kept reporting news of Crowhurst's steady progress. Crowhurst then decided to go off the air altogether, telling Hallworth he was having trouble with his equipment. The stress of keeping up appearances was beginning to take its toll. Crowhurst's tape recordings became rambling and incoherent. I'm drunk, you circum, you silly old circum. You're as drunk as a circumnavigator could be. <laughs> it is a terrible thing, but I think I'll just have another little swig of this boy here. On April 9th, after slowly sailing north, Crowhurst at last broke radio silence, sending yet another false position report. By May 4th, Crowhurst's false route met up with a point he would have reached had he been sailing honestly around the world. In theory, then, he would have gone all the way across here, around the world, past New Zealand, and here he is coming in towards Cape Horn. And this, of course, means that he's now back, in theory, close to his actual position. Crowhurst's family excitedly awaited his return. He had now been at sea seven months. There was a tremendous excitement when we heard that when the radio silence, when his radio silence was broken, we heard that he was returning home and everyone was smiling and uh, we, we just thought it was wonderful. Crowhurst appeared to be in the lead, but he didn't want to win, fearing that his logs wouldn't stand up to close scrutiny. He was quite happy to come in second, knowing that the publicity would still help his ailing electronics company. As he headed north up the Atlantic, Crowhurst then heard that Nigel Tetley, his nearest competitor, had dropped out when his boat sank. Now, Crowhurst was definitely leading the race. He knew it would only be a matter of time before his deceit was exposed. Fear is a hardwired response to danger. The fear system in the brain just simply hasn't changed very much over the course of evolution. Some gain strength. Most of us flee, while others become paralyzed. They say you're never more alive than when you're at the door of death. Why are we afraid? Primal Fear, tomorrow at 8 on History International. Don't be surprised if good things start popping up everywhere. When you switch to 21st Century Auto Insurance, it starts with big savings, $300 to $400 or more. Could you save that much? 
Geico customers who switch save an average of $331. Allstate customers, $418. Progressive customers who switch save an average of $430. Like these drivers, you could save two or three times as much when you compare us to any other insurer. How much might your savings be? Call 21st Century Insurance now at 1-800-420-7536 to find out. You'll switch for the lower rates and stay for services that can save you even more. Our policies come loaded with added value, like fast, 24 Four hour roadside assistance at no additional cost. Does your policy give you that? Big savings and great services could be popping up for you. Why wait? Call 21st Century Insurance at 1 800 420 7536 or go to 21st.com for your free rate quote now. Starting now? Starting now? Starting now. Starting now? I'm not going to blindly hope last year's investing strategies still work today. I'll make decisions based on facts, not feelings. We have a choice in today's market keep doing the same old thing or become smarter, better prepared investors. Starting now, I'm not going to let myself get caught off guard again. There's never been a better time than now for Investools, a comprehensive program that combines education and the tools to put it all to work. It gives us a deeper understanding of how the market works and helps us spot opportunities we didn't find before. You'll be equipped to make more confident, informed decisions, no matter if you're a seasoned investor or just starting out. It's good. I learn when and where I want, and I move at my own pace. Start with the fundamentals, like protecting your investment capital and analyzing the market. Then continue on to more advanced topics, like learning to spot opportunities the way the pros do, even in a down market. Starting now, whether the stock market goes up, down, or sideways, I'll be more prepared to deal with it. We don't just have to rely on what our broker says. Not anymore. You'll proceed quickly, step by step, with quizzes to check your progress. I'm looking out for my own financial well-being. Hey, it's my money. When it's time to make a move, we're never completely on our own. If I have a question, I can get live one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I can even join their online community of other student investors. Start your risk-free 30-day trial today, and you'll get immediate access to our Investing Foundation online course, where you'll learn to pick and evaluate stocks. Immediate access to the Investor Toolbox, with tools that are intuitive and easy to use and a certificate to attend a hands-on workshop in person. Before you know it, you'll be on your way. Yeah, even in this economy, I can find solid investing opportunities. Starting now, I'm taking control of my financial future. Your future starts now with InvestTools. Are you or a loved one addicted to drugs or alcohol? I'm Chris Prentice of the Passages Addiction Cure Center in Malibu, California, where every day we cure people of their dependency. Passages is not a 12-step program, and we do not believe in the disease concept. My book, The Alcoholism and Addiction Cure, shows you exactly what we do at Passages so you, too, can save a life that's worth saving. To get my book delivered to your doorstep, call 888-THE-CURE or go to PassagesMalibu.com. On June 5, 1969, Donald Crowhurst crossed the equator. He was just two weeks from home, and barring a catastrophe, was apparently the clear winner of the round-the-world solo yacht race. He had been at sea for 217 days, and the sight of a passing cruise liner made him long for human company again. Crowhurst was teetering on the edge of a complete mental breakdown. Meanwhile, congratulatory messages continued to pour into the boat. The thought of the reception that awaited him back home served only to heighten Crowhurst's fragile state of mind. Rodney Hallworth's publicity machine was in full swing. The momentum was almost unstoppable as Tinmouth got ready to welcome its hero. It was a great gala, you know, we're hoping it to be a great gala affair. And um, <clears throat> newspaper men from abroad, Canada, America, France, they're all, they're all booked in hotels. And uh, oh, a thousand arrangements have been made to welcome him home. Crowhurst faced a dilemma. What should he do? Tell the truth and face the consequences? Or appear the winner and live a lie for the rest of his life? Was there an alternative that would get him off the hook? On June 23rd, he made his last entry in the navigation log. His mind was wandering, and he filled the other logs with poems, quotations, 
and long, rambling essays on the meaning of life. Two days later, the Tinmouth Electron was spotted by the crew of the SS Cuyahoga, a Norwegian cargo vessel. Crowhurst, seeming pleased, smiled and waved. On June 28th, Crowhurst received a message telling him that his family, together with the world's press and about 100,000 sightseers, would be waiting to greet him at the Silly Isles, just off the southwest coast of Britain. In what now appears to have been his last rational act, Crowhurst said he didn't want anyone to meet him. He didn't explain why. Then he made his last tape recording. It's true. There is a danger that um, the way we live nowadays just poisons us with sitting down, worrying, worrying about our nearest competitor in our level of the pyramid, getting one across the rat race, all that, plus the extreme unhealthy way of life. I'm sure we're in terrible danger from it. And there's absolutely nothing like going to sea but getting rid of all the poisons, you know? The poisons in your body, you must get rid of them. I don't know what they are, but they've got to go. Um, the sea is the way to get rid of them, I'm sure. I feel in tremendous shape. I've never felt so. Then the tape ran out. Nothing more was heard of Crowhurst until on July 10th, the Tinmouth Electron was spotted drifting in the mid-Atlantic. There was no sign of the lone yachtsman. When the Tinmouth Electron was found, the boat was only 1,800 miles short of Britain. The Royal Mail vessel Picardy hoisted the boat aboard and delivered it to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. On July 12th, the Crowhurst family received the devastating news that Donald was missing. His son, Simon, recalled the effect it had on them. Really, the first news that we had that things were so terrible, my mother took us all upstairs and we sat on a bed and she said that the boat had been found and that my father wasn't on it. And at which point she began to cry and um, we were just stunned. We, we didn't know what it meant. We knew that there was a search still on, so we felt quite optimistic that he might be found. And when the truth about what had happened, when the logbooks finally began to be studied and people began to realise what had happened, uh, it was very difficult for my mother to explain to us. In Tidmouth, the news was greeted with shocked disbelief. Everyone had been looking forward to welcoming home the town hero. But as the logs were examined and the deception became clear, people were not so well disposed towards Crowhurst, whatever had happened to him. Captain Rich recalled his earlier misgivings when Crowhurst reported he was making 243 miles a day, a remarkable achievement for someone who, at first, had lagged so far behind. It was at that particular stage that things started to change. And indeed, when I reconstructed his route sometime later, once uh, uh, the logbooks had been brought back to uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, in fact, it was from that um, period on that we had two voyages, if you like. The real voyage, which took him down to the Falklands, uh, roughly and back again, and the fraudulent voyage, which indeed uh, he pretended to go around the world. When he read the logs for himself, Simon Crowhurst was in no doubt that his father had committed suicide. Right at the end of the logbook, the writing reaches a kind of conclusion, and he writes the words, it is finished, it is the mercy, and says that he will resign the game and gives the time that he'll do so, which is the time just shortly after the, the time of the last messages. And the most likely conclusion from that is that is when he had decided to die. But no matter how shamefully his voyage had ended, Crowhurst had actually sailed 16,500 miles in 243 days. No mean feat with such an inexperienced yachtsman. Robin Knox Johnston, the eventual winner of the race, gave the 5,000 pound prize to a fund started for Claire Crowhurst and her children. 
None of us should judge him too harshly, Knox Johnson said at the time. It was a fitting tribute to a brave, if flawed and misguided man. There are always going to be surprises.